Suspect based profiling. Why is it one of the most problematic forms of offender profiling? So suspect based profiling occurs when we're making decisions or judgments about individuals because of their race, ethnicity, culture, gender, sexual orientation, age, economic status, background, or even personal characteristics. So ultimately, it's when we attribute a behavior or a crime to a group or even a specific individual because of these specific personal characteristics. So to really understand suspect-based profiling, we need to look at what guides our decision making and there's some really interesting psychological work around why we make certain decisions and also how they can be quite problematic. Now the first thing to understand is this idea of attribution or how we attribute behavior to individuals or how we attribute behavior or actions to ourselves. So in the simplest sense an attribution is how we go about explaining behavior. But when we also think about attributions, we have this thing called an attribution bias. Now an attribution bias occurs when the explanation that we give for either our behavior or the behavior of others doesn't really actually reflect reality. So instead we're either overvaluing or undervaluing information to reach that conclusion about why that behavior or decision has been made by that individual or by us. So behavior can be influenced by both individual factors and also external factors. And that these individual and external factors often play really interesting parts when we're thinking about attribution bias and how we go about explaining why behaviors have occurred. So when we're thinking about internal factors, we're talking about something about that person. So their personality or their character. Then when we're thinking about external factors, we're talking about environmental or situational factors that have led or caused that behavior to occur. And one of the best examples of this is the idea of being cut off by someone when we're driving. So straight away we could have the thought that they cut me off because they are a dangerous driver. So we attribute it to being something about the individual, about that specific person. Or alternatively, we can have the idea that you know they cut me off because this road is simply unsafe. And that's an example of those external factors coming into play in that second explanation. Now there's different ways in which attribution bias can really be quite troubling. And there's four types of attribution bias that are really important to make sure that we cover and understand clearly. So the first is this idea of a fundamental attribution error. And this occurs when we tend to explain an individual's behavior simply based on internal factors. So they acted that way because of who they are. It's something about them, it's something about their personality or their character that caused them to act that way. So we might have the example that the child stole the candy bar because they're clearly a delinquent. Then we have another type of attribution error which is called the ultimate attribution bias. So this is a case of comparing the in-group, so my group, compared to the out group, which is your group. So it involves making a judgment about a person because they belong to a different group. And we attribute the behavior of that person to occurring due to them belonging to that group. So the way they act is reflective of those attributes and characteristics of that group. So again, we focus on giving the explanation an internal reason for why it occurred. It's because of that group membership. So commonly bad behaviors are seen to be reflective of that group or that out group. And positive behaviors are really viewed as being a mere exception or in many aspects an outlier. So it's not representative of that group, it's just this odd case that it occurred. So another type of attribution bias is the actor observer bias. And this occurs when we attribute someone else's behavior to being reflective of their character Yet when it comes to ourselves, we believe that we acted in a certain way because of external or situational factors. So in essence, we observe and make judgments about others, but when we act in a certain way, we really fail to observe ourselves 
So instead, when we're judging ourselves, we believe that we acted in that way because of the situational factors, rather than being able to step back and take another perspective to see actually how that might have looked and it wasn't actually due to the situational factors. So the actor-observer bias really reflects our tendency to be able to focus on others and attribute things to them and it being about their character, but not being able to apply the same things to ourselves. And then lastly, we have the hostile attribution bias. And this is the tendency to perceive the behavior of others as hostile, aggressive, or even threatening. So ultimately, we attribute the behavior or the intent of that behavior as being intended to cause harm. And the common issue is that we interpret that that intent to cause harm or that intent to be aggressive is directed at us. So an example might be that a colleague picks up your pen during the meeting and then after the meeting leaves and exits the meeting holding your pen still. So instead of believing that this might have been a mistake or an error, an example of a hostile attribution bias would be thinking that the person did it deliberately, they were targeting you and they were trying to send a message for example that they won't be pushed around and they can take what they want. So it's really an example of that distorted thinking and taking motives or intent out of context and thinking that it's actually something much more hostile than it is. So we see from looking at attribution bias that there's a number of ways that our thinking can really go askew and also there's quite some flaws in our decision making. So really we have our own inherent biases that influence our decision making and our judgment of others. But if we look even further into how we process social information, it's actually even more concerning just how bad our judgment of others is. So there's been a number of researchers that suggest that we tend to make judgments of other individuals within simply the, the quick and short time frame of 100 milliseconds. So it's a very rapid, quick judgment where we make a decision about that person and their character in a matter of milliseconds. And this has led to what's been termed the first impression problem. And we've had Babiak and colleagues and also Baker and colleagues use this term to really describe the issues that arise from first impressions. So in essence, if we like someone upon first meeting them, then we actually look for further information to support that impression. So we filter out information that contradicts this first impression and actually only look for preferential information that supports our first impressions or first hypotheses about the person. And this also works if we don't actually like the person either. So if we don't like them, we'll keep looking for more reasons not to like the person rather than actually looking at information that might contradict that and suggest that there is actually some likeable qualities to this individual. And then the other issue of the first impression problem is that we're more likely to like the people that are similar to us. So if people are different to us, then naturally we tend to be a bit more reserved, a bit more hesitant, a bit more cautious about them. So again, we tend to only favour those that are similar to us which even more supports the idea of having a bias towards our in-group and tending to be more critical of those that don't actually fit our in-group and may in fact be in the out-group. So they stay stuck in the out-group because we simply can't shift our first impressions. We keep looking for information that supports that and says that they are actually different to us and we don't want to include them in our in-group. So there's been some really interesting research around how we decide whether we like someone, whether someone's trustworthy, and what information we use to make those decisions. So research suggests that facial symmetry, attractiveness, baby faceness, so looking more like a baby in appearance, higher eyebrows, larger eyes, are actually associated with a greater signaling and indication that someone is in fact trustworthy. So if someone has those features, we're more likely to believe that they're a trustworthy individual. So making intuitive judgments on a person's character can be really quite problematic, obviously for a number of reasons, and particularly because of how we make that judgment and what we're making that judgment based on.
So ultimately, humans are not good at making decisions about a person's character and also whether we may determine them to be trustworthy or not. And this tendency towards flawed judgment led Porter and Tabrink to coin the term dangerous decision theory. And this is really about the instantaneous decisions that people make about someone's character based on, in many aspects, trivial or flawed information, such as the person's level of attractiveness. So dangerous decision theory suggests that we make decisions about a person based on irrelevant information, which leads us then to make conclusions about their character, their personality, and even whether we can trust them or not. So Porter and Tabrink believe that in high stakes situations, such as jury decisions, or when a person is highly motivated or even quite emotional, incorrect or even irrelevant details are often what they make those decisions on. And these details lead to decisions being made nearly based on a form of tunnel vision. So they focus so much on the details, noticing only the preferential information and then ignoring anything that contradicts that. So Porter, Tabrink and Gastor in a 2010 paper sought to look more into dangerous decision theory. And they looked at how this might influence the evaluation of legal evidence and a defendant's culpability. So the study employed 88 participants with the authors developing four vignettes. So two of these vignettes related to major crimes and two related to minor crimes. So the major crimes were a robbery that progressed to murder and also a sexualized homicide. Then in terms of the minor crimes, we had a car theft and also a fraud offense. Now, as part of the study, the authors conducted an earlier research study where they had participants look at 20 photographs of Caucasian males and rate their level of attractiveness, their baby faceness, their facial symmetry, their perceived level of kindness, and also ultimately to determine whether they consider the person to be trustworthy. And then based on this, the top most trustworthy and top most untrustworthy faces were then used in the main study by the authors. Now participants were also presented with evidence and as part of the earlier pilot study, the authors also had the participants evaluate the evidence determining whether they believed that it was ambiguous evidence or highly incriminating evidence. So some of this evidence included eyewitness statements, alibis, exonerating information, confessions, and even supposed DNA evidence about the suspect. So in the actual main study with the 88 participants, each participant received two vignettes. So one would be of a major crime and one would be of a minor crime. And each of the vignettes contained a photo of a suspect, so a trustworthy and an untrustworthy individual. And there was also five pieces of ambiguous evidence, five pieces of incriminating evidence, and also one component of evidence that was potentially exonerating. Now, the findings of this research were really interesting. So less evidence was used to convict suspects that appeared to be untrustworthy. Now, again, we're talking about this being just based on their appearance, and this was most notable in higher severity cases, so they were more likely to be convicted on less evidence, particularly in the murder case. So if you committed a serious crime and looked untrustworthy, you're in big trouble basically. The ambiguous evidence was also enough for participants to decide that an untrustworthy person was actually guilty, whereas for the trustworthy characters, a greater level of incriminating evidence was needed for participants to determine a guilty verdict for the trustworthy looking individual. Interestingly, no difference was observed in the amount of evidence needed to convict people for minor crimes. So if someone was trustworthy or untrustworthy, it didn't make a difference in the amount of evidence required for the participants to reach a guilty verdict. Participants were also much more confident in their decision to rule someone guilty 
when the suspect was an untrustworthy individual that was charged with murder. So the findings suggested that the severity of behaviour or the more significant the event, the greater the likelihood that dangerous decision theory or decision making may actually occur. And really, dangerous decision theory really highlights the flaws in human perception and even character judgment. So we've spoken a lot about how we go about making decisions and also the number of issues, number of distortions that can arise in our decision making. And when we think about this idea of suspect-based profiling, we need to remember that we're making decisions about people based on specific features or their possible affiliations that they may be connected to. So what do we really need to be most concerned about when we're thinking about suspect-based profiling? Well, there's two areas that really seem to come into play and are particularly problematic when we're thinking about suspect-based profiling. And most of this seems to centre on race, which is what we would deem racial profiling. And to a degree, racial profiling then overlaps with really what we'd probably coin now as terroristic profiling. So saying that someone appears to be potentially a terrorist. So let's delve into racial profiling a bit more. Now Jack Glass has published a really good book called Suspect Race and it looks deeply into the idea of racial profiling and many of the issues that are associated with it. And Glass opposes a couple of really interesting scenarios which he actually credits back to Stanford Law Professor Richard Banks. Now, the first scenario is that you're a transit safety administration screener at an airport. Homeland Security has placed the terrorism threat level at its highest. Now, three Middle Eastern men approach the screening area. Do you give them special attention or not? Now, this is a really interesting scenario that Glass has presented. So what information do you base this decision on? What weight do you give to the reasons why you might decide one thing, but then what about the information that you might be ignoring in not actioning the other side of the argument? So it really gives us something to think about. What would your decision be? Glasser then extends the scenario even further and then goes on to say what if the TSA had announced that there was a specific information that Al-Qaeda was planning to perpetrate an attack in the United States in the next two days. Now when that's narrowed down even further would that then change your approach to that scenario and how you go about trying to decide whether you would screen the men or let them through. And again, I think sometimes the more information that we have, potentially the more easier it is to decide. But when things are a little bit more ambiguous, then it can be quite challenging to work out which way we would in fact go. So the scenario in Glass's book has really interesting real world applications. And in 2014, Attorney General Eric Holder announced an overhaul in federal policing policies in regard to suspect-based or biased profiling. And the policy stipulated that a person cannot be targeted as a suspect based on their race, ethnicity, gender, religion, national orientation, sexuality, or gender identity. So it's stipulated that police officers must have trustworthy information to action any suspects based on specific identifying characteristics. And officers were prohibited from using any degree of these characteristics when making routine or spontaneous decisions such as police checks for example. So what exactly are we talking about with the term racial profiling? Well, Glasser defines racial profiling as the following. So racial profiling is the use of race or ethnicity or proxies thereof by law enforcement officials as a basis for judgment or criminal suspicion. But unfortunately, racial profiling is not 
a new concept. And it even dates back to the work of Caesar Lombroso. So Lombroso suggested that there were four types of criminals. We had the activist or the born criminal, the insane, the occasional and impassioned criminal. So the activist or born criminal was identifiable based on their physiological traits. So it suggested a biological predisposition to criminal behaviour. So Lombroso believed that blacks were the least evolved of the races and hence more likely to become criminals. And whites were considered to be at the top of the evolutionary hierarchy. And when we look through the literature around really racial profiling or particularly the targeting of ethnicities or races in relation to criminal behaviour, the research really seems to point to about the 1970s and a marked shift really occurring at that time. So according to Russell in his 2002 paper, previously race was linked with black men really committing petty crimes. But then in the 70s, there was really this shift from no longer black individuals being associated with petty crimes to actually instead really being viewed as, as criminal predators. And around this time as well, many African Americans were being pulled over simply for looking suspicious or being in their motor vehicles and, and driving around. And this led to one of the, the famous terms, which has since been coined, driving while black. And if we look at some of the statistics that were around in the 90s and, and early 2000s, it's, it's certainly quite concerning around some of the opinions around how likely people believe black or African American people to be to commit crime, particularly to commit a violent crime. So a 1990 survey revealed that 54% of white people that were surveyed believed that blacks were very likely to commit acts of violence. Another study in the 90s, which was based in Canada, found that 65% of respondents believed that black individuals committed more crimes than any other ethnicities or races. And figures from the US in 2002 by the US Department of Justice revealed that African Americans represented only 13% of the American population but did account for 38% of arrests for violent crimes. But again, how do we understand that statistic? Is that actually reflective of black people committing more crimes? Or is it reflective of law enforcement targeting more black individuals and hence therefore they're more likely to be arrested for crimes? Is it likely that white people are still committing crimes or other ethnicities are committing crimes yet? They don't receive the same law enforcement attention. And what about the role of the media in shaping some of those perceptions? So research suggests that there's this disproportionate amount of media coverage for black crimes, particularly black crimes of violence, compared to individuals that are white and commit crimes. And there seems to be this reoccurring theme in a lot of media coverage of young black people committing violent crimes. So when we think about racial profiling and when we think about the statistics but also some of the broader implications at really a media and societal level, there's certainly this worry that we start to create these associations which are very weak at best but we start to believe that they are much stronger and that nearly there's this strong relationship which in, in some aspects is actually absolute. So that black people are associated with an increased risk of violent crime. And really when we step back from that, and, and again we go back to those attributions, even things such as our ultimate attribution bias, we've got to look at that and look at what the statistics tell us because making these decisions is easy to paint a whole population or a whole group with, with the one brush, when in fact it's actually really a small segment of individuals but they are not reflective of the whole population. And when we're talking about racial profiling, we're talking about a small percentage of individuals, yet suddenly we typecast all the people that fit that group or fit that, arguably, that profile. And then we switch over to terrorism, which is also quite intertwined with the idea of racial profiling. 
and really a notably different form of racial profiling emerged following the September 11 attacks. And this really led to this, what is now known as this misconception around someone looking like a terrorist. And for many years, and still currently, people that resembled Arabic or Muslim orientation were perceived as a terrorist, but also really became targets for law enforcement investigation, particularly things such as border security or when they're going through airports. So this idea of the Arab terrorist or the Muslim terrorist really emerged as a form of a profile. And particularly in certain law enforcement and border security contexts, it was something that they were very active on. And we go back to that scenario about three Arabic or three Muslim individuals walking through the airport, that was the time when, particularly post 9-11, when there was certainly a lot of activity going on around the idea of racial profiling or someone appearing to look like a terrorist. So how reliable is it to assume that someone that's Arab or Muslim is in fact a terrorist? Well, we've got the example of the winner of Miss America, Nina Davaluri, and she was subjected to considerable harassment over her culture. And it really reflected significant evidence of racial profiling, but even more so, arguably, quite reflective of racism. But the other side of the argument centres on, is there a just reason to engage in racial profiling when terrorism can cause such destruction? But again, I think we've got to come back to what's the implications of that. So let's say that every one in 10,000 Arab or Muslim individuals ends up becoming a terrorist. That is a lot of discrimination, mistreatment, and even interrogation to target the one person that may fit that terrorist or racial profile. So surely when we look at the numbers, we realize that suspect-based profiling of a person based on their appearance is not using evidence and ultimately very flawed judgment. Now there's also the argument about why are we only marginalizing Arab or Muslim individuals as perpetrators of terrorism because we've had many different individuals of different cultures, different ethnicities that have perpetrated terrorism over the years. So we have to be careful, again, when we use terms like the ultimate attribution error, when we use dangerous decision theory to not associate things as being absolute. We need to step back and take a proper perspective and a proper look at situations to realise that these types of profiling, these types of suspect based profiling is actually quite problematic. And so the best analogy for this is, can you judge a book by its cover? Well of course it's a, it's a difficult answer. And the simple response may be sometimes, but in saying that, how many times is it okay to be wrong before you're actually right? And as it turns out, we don't actually always actually know what is a good book cover, or let alone a good book. So often we only want something that suits us, and we don't actually know what is in fact a good book after all. So putting all the analogies aside, humans have many faults in their judgment of character. We use dodgy cognitive shortcuts to determine whether we like someone, and we're even more likely to make incorrect decisions about someone when the stakes are high or when we're actually really motivated to do so. So the takeaway here is that suspect-based profiling is ultimately flimsy at best. It involves flawed decisions or judgments about groups or individuals based on a loose set of associations. And there's really no evidence to support these associations. And really, they are a result of bias and cognitive distortion.